Um, going to call this meeting of the Planning Commission to order at 7 o'clock, May 14th. Um, can you call the roll, please? Indeed. <clears throat> Pelzell? Here. Doden? Here. Stiles? Here. McQueen? Here. Donnell? Here. Also present is Planning and Zoning Administrator Denise Swinger and Village Solicitor Chris Connard. Okay. Um, so I'm going to review the agenda. We're going to do the minutes for my last two meetings. Um, then we have a minor subdivision replat um, on the consent, consent agenda. If we have questions or want to talk about that at all, we need to move it off the consent agenda and we'll discuss it normally. Um, right? That's correct. Okay. Um, and then we will do communications. We have two communications. Um, then council report, Marianne. Then we'll have citizens' comments for anything that's not on the agenda. Um, then we have two public hearings, um, both conditional use applications, one from um, the owners of 102 Pleasant Street and then the owners of 335 Orton Road. And we'll um, hear the staff report, um, talk to the applicant, um, then we'll open a public hearing, and then we'll discuss it up here. Um, then we have some old business, minimum lot frontages, um, talking about RVs and tiny homes, RV parking, and um, discuss our work on the comprehensive land use plan, and maybe talk about new business and agenda planment, planning, and then it's, that's it. Okay, so let's do the minutes. Um, from April 9th, first, does anyone have any uh, changes for page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, <laughs> or page six. I just have a, a change in the spelling of Michaela Grant, the interim's name. M I C H E L A. M I C H E L A? Yeah. Do I hear a motion? I move approval of the minutes. Second. Sec um, with the. With the change that Denise mentioned. Yeah. You want to call that? Oh, or you can just voice vote that one. I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, any, everyone. How do I do that? Say all, all in favor. favor. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Abstain? Okay. Next, um, <clears throat> the we had a special work session for the um, con comprehensive land use plan on Monday, April 24th. Does anyone see any? Oh, because it was Tuesday. Thank you. Mm, it Changed was. Everything. Thank you. Good call. Everyone okay with that? Do I hear a motion? I move approval of the minutes on April 24th. Second. Um, everyone in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Okay, we were all there. So. That's that. Okay, next is the consent agenda. Do you want to explain how that works real quick? Sure. Um, items on the consent agenda, if can simply move to Denise's purview if there's a motion to approve those, those items. If anyone has questions about them or feels they need to discuss it, you move it off the consent agenda and it goes on to your regular agenda. So if there are no questions or concerns, you take a motion to approve, move through the vote process, and you're done with it. If there are concerns or questions, you move it off the consent agenda, and that takes a motion as well. I move, we approve. I second. 
Do I just say? You can voice vote that. Okay. So. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. That's done. Um, next, uh, communications. Do you want to talk about that? Um, yes. Uh, the Housing Advisory Board, um, one of the things that they suggested was uh, getting the Antioch proposal for the Pocket Neighborhood Development to the Planning Commission now. Um, that is going to be coming up this year, um, maybe by the end of the summer. Um, they've already submitted um, uh, the beginnings of the replat. Um, and then uh, we'll do rezoning as well as um, start that conditional use process maybe in the next few months. So this is just for your information only, just to give you an idea of what they're looking at doing. Denise, what streets, uh, because it doesn't say what street on the map that they it's provided. It's on East North College. East North College. And is it on a, uh, is it on a quarter? It's uh, at the corner of Livermore. 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 Yeah, is it Livermore? Yeah, Livermore. This is Livermore. Thank you. Yeah, there aren't any buildings there now. Okay. Um, council report. Oh, the other thing. Oh, the other thing was the housing documents. Um, Marianne, did you want to explain that? The the three pieces of just briefly. It's just for their information at this point, but. Yes, there were three documents that I sent to planning commission. One was a cover page that went to Village Council just reviewing what had happened at the Planning Advisory Board and uh, what we're suggesting as next steps, which is a, just a, giving a very brief outline of a potential housing initiative process. Then the Housing Advisory Board created a summary of the community conversations on housing. That was a two-page two-page document that really uh, summarized, I think it did a good job of capturing the main issues that came up during the community conversations on housing, both what people saw as trends, what concerns they had about the trends, what, what they liked, what they didn't like, and what people's uh, suggestions were for the type of housing that we most need, we'd like to see. So, uh, so there's that. And then at the last council meeting, council had a first reading of six ordinances that have come from planning commission that are basically clarifying texts in each instance. And then at the next council meeting, they will have a second reading. So does anyone have any questions about either the housing initiative process, where it stands, or the, resol the ordinances? No, uh, I don't. Thank you for updating us about the thing. I'll, uh, I'll send whatever comes to council about housing, I'll send on to Planning Commission. OK, so we've done communications and council report. Um, I, now, uh, if anyone has anything they want to say that's about something that's not on the agenda for tonight, um, you can come up and talk about it now. If not, um, I, I just like yeah. I, I noticed that I think there are a few people here who are interested in the Antioch pocket neighborhood. Just so you understand, we aren't actually discussing it tonight. Just wanted to make sure you understood that. Yeah, that, that was part of the communications that we received, correct? So if there's something that they'd like to say yeah, about it, Yeah, if you would like to would say something yes. during citizens' comment, you're welcome to do so. Thank you. And so just state your name. My name is Patricia Brown, and... Um, I really didn't come prepared to say anything, but I just wanted to say that I'm very excited that Antioch College is moving forward 
to doing the pocket neighborhood uh, and that it's going to be small homes, uh, eight, four bedroom, four one bedrooms and four two bedrooms and the one bedrooms will be attached. Um, also, I think to me another very exciting part of it is that its intent is to make this as environmentally sustainable as um, the laws of Ohio <laughs> will allow. We would very much um, uh, like to have zero net energy and, and that of course is doable, but we would also like to have net zero water, which would be a big step forward because the Ohio laws are not um, written to support that at this point in time. So anyway, I just um, would be encourage uh, this, all your support in making this happen. It's been a long dream for a lot of us, and it's also been, uh, might be a big boost to Antioch College, whose mission is to have uh, support and develop environmental sustainability. And this would be a big part of their mission. Thank you. Thank you. That was actually very enlightening. Um, anyone else? Okay. Um, so next, uh, we can, we're going to talk about the conditional use application. It's not me, right? Okay. Um, one and two pleasant. <clears throat> at 102 Pleasant. Carol Gifford, um, she's here, present. Um, she uh, and Daniel Murphy, is he present? Okay. Yeah. He's not, okay. Um, have submitted an application for a conditional use hearing um, for an accessory dwelling unit. They purchased the home at 102 Pleasant Street. Um, it does not have a, a garage. Um, so they are going to um, build an accessory structure, a garage, but they would like to also have an accessory dwelling unit upstairs. Um, so that does mean that they have to come for this planning hearing. Um, they uh, are on a corner lot, so they had setbacks on both sides, 20 feet, um, they, which was not a problem. They meet all of the setback requirements, the lot coverage requirements, the parking uh, requirements for this. Um, and they, everything um, that is required in the conditional application, they have met those conditions. Anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions for Denise? Yeah, I do. Um, on the site plan, it shows that the setback is off of the property that's beyond what looks to be like an abandoned alley or an easement that is contiguous to the properties to the left. And I'm not sure where that property is. Yeah, it does look kind of weird. You said there was a 20 foot setback just now. This says 10. Yeah, um, and I think that the property owner can address that because she told me that the, the drawings were a little off, but that they had measured that it was 20 feet from the property line. Um, maybe, Carol? Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not you, because you have like the, the two vehicles like look like they're over the property line oh. rather than. So if you look on the map, I if you look on the map, there's two indications, one's two and five eighths and one's two and seven eighths, and those are supposedly both the same um, feet. I can't remember, I don't have it in front of me, 70 something <coughs> feet. And so. 78.75. Thank you. So every other dimension on the map matches the longer one, so that two and five eighths is, it seems incorrect, and that the property line looks like it probably continues from that, um, that property on Walnut Street. That, well, does I that make sense? the back 
Well, Ted was talking about the back, yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah. So, Ellie, is it abandoned? So, see how the property lines right. are? Yeah. So, what's the question? The question is that, you know, like, does your, does your property, like, extend, what is this? That's all her property. As far as That's all your yeah, property. Yes. Yeah. Oh. It's a flag-shaped property. So. Oh, okay. Because it had been an abandoned alley. Or so that whole strip goes with your property. Yes. What's the term you used? Flag-shaped property? Oh, flag. Oh, flag-shaped. Okay. Flag. Yeah, yeah. Shaped yes. like a flag. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Interesting. Does that answer your question, Ted? Well, yeah, but it raises questions now. I mean, um, in, in essence, I'm not quite sure if there's a if there's an access easement or a property line all the way down that per, that doesn't let the properties attached in the back it's it's all one property that it doesn't look because she has that 24 by 24 picture over there if you would go on gis it's just all there is no property line across there it that whole her property is all of that, what was possibly an alley at one point, as well as it's behind the other shape. people's. Well, then why do all of the uh, lots say 150 feet? Well, that's the, that's mm -hmm. going that direction dimension. So she's saying yeah, but if this her, to if her here property is 150 extends, and this to here is 150. I mean, I think that's probably mm -hmm. just a sort of part of how GIS is well, saying it. We can't go on supposition. We yeah. can't give approval well, based on supposition. If there's a survey that just delineate, delineates the property line so that we can determine whether or not they fit proper setbacks, that's what our board is for. You know, I, I can't yeah. well, look and we at can a GIS make, map and say that this is, this is meaningless. Okay, so we can make a condition that yeah. they have to provide that, or, yeah. or they have to bring that forward closer to the house. They have plenty of room yeah, to do Yeah, there is room. Yeah. yeah, they've got plenty of room, so. I might speak. Yeah, please do. Inspect the property. Can you state your name? I'm Bob Swainy. Um, that photograph that you have that the overlay is on, that is the GIS photograph, and the yellow lines are the property lines according to the county GIS. Um, now, we've found pins at the three locations. We did not find a pin all the way down that alley. We didn't think that that was pertinent, and it really is unusual that they've attached this alley. In fact, I've been talking with Carol. I said, you should abandon that. And <laughs> give the property to the local owners so that they can pay the taxes on it instead of you because it's useless. Um, and there is no easement over it. It has all been paved. Uh, there's no easement of record on the deed. Um, and that pin is visible on the front corner of the lot and on that corner, on the adjacent corner there down uh, Walnut Street. And the pin, the other pin on the other corner of the front of the house on Pleasant Street. Uh, we did find those, but there has not been a survey recently. Well, I mean, it does seem that there is enough room. At the same time, we want to ensure that we that it's clear where the property line is. So, what it is, needs to be ten feet from that property line. Yeah. So, from that pin. Well, is the pin. The property line pin or is it what have, have you confirmed that that pin is you know there should be a survey if there's a pin at, at in at the county I have not seen a previous survey yet. but we did discover the pins do you have a deed with the coordinates Okay, you want to keep going and then come back to us? 
to Keep us. Going. Okay. Well, um, just open a public hearing yeah. before we would make a motion. And sure. Um, on our oh, okay. Sounds good. Yeah, sounds fine. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to open a public hearing. Anyone who would like to comment on this conditional use application, please come forward and state your name. Okay. Hearing none. Going to close the public hearing and bring it back up to us. I would mo make a motion that we approve the application um, with the following condition that the owner submit a deed that describes the pop property boundaries and resubmits a site plan for the record showing that the accessory dwelling unit is within the setback requirements based on that deed. Okay. You made a motion. Second. You seconded? Yeah. Okay. Let's let Judy get that down and she'll read it back to us. do this a couple of times just to get it straight. So your motion is to approve the conditional use application um, contingent upon submittal of a deed describing the property, property boundaries and resubmission of a, well, and a new site plan um, that indicates that the uh, accessory dwelling unit slash garage is uh, within the 10 foot setback or outside of the 10, I'm not sure. You within want to, the setbacks. Within the setbacks. I have a question, uh, I guess, before we vote. And Ted, you may know the answer to this, and Denise. If a survey is done that would be of the entire property, because once you have an abandoned alley, I understand you have to have a survey done and have it filed with the county, would it then remove all of these yellow lines and show it as one property, or would it keep these yellow lines? You're, you're saying if you that would they'd have to replant that, replant giving that to, to those other owners right now. Probably what you'll find at Green County is a survey. When it was done, I don't know, but there'd be a survey that would show how it is right so now. So the alley, even though it's theirs, if it's not replanted, is it actually then a part of this property? That's they're paying. Yeah, they're, they're paying, still is. They're paying. Yeah. Okay. For that. Yes. Okay. Which is unusual. I haven't seen that before. You know, and the reason that the reason that this board has to have a document that's official is because if a if by chance you start to build and the neighbor then complains and we approve something that isn't accurate, which a GIS map is not accurate, yeah. then we are subject to liability as well as you. And so we have to make sure and ensure that those legal documents are in place for our approvals. I, I suspect what happened was that there was one family that owned, I mean, family members owned both of these houses, and the house on the corner was the one that requested the alley That's vacation, so and so it yeah. went with that yeah. house. But I think both houses were owned by members of the same family. So they probably actually have like 165 feet along that property line, it was just never incorporated in, or 100, 157 and a half, if the other property owner received it off the other side, but I don't think that's the case. Hmm. But You know, that another sounds, thing that happens that you might consider is that if the adjacent property owner were to submit an application for an accessory unit on their property, you know, if that 10 foot is where it is, then you're really kind of taking the opportunity for them to use a bigger backyard um, because the setback would go from your property line and then that would be their setback. So, you know, I don't know what advantage there is to, to owning that, but I think you could probably swing a pretty good deal with that adjacent property owner to, to beat them over some. Yeah. Okay, so we have a motion on the table. Um, and was Doden the second on that? Yes. Yes. I did. Have oh, a did okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. You. So you. You guys are ready to call the roll okay. if you are. Yes. In fact, please ready. call the roll. Indeed. All right. Doden. 
Yes. Stiles. Yes. Donnell. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Pelzel. Yes. Okay. So that was great. Okay. So um, next, uh, we have a conditional use application from Stephen and Stacy Wirig, owners of eight. Uh, 335 Orton Road, uh, seeking approval for an accessory dwelling unit. Okay, um, this application for a conditional use hearing is um, for a pool house. Um, when the architect submitted the um, drawing, the pool house um, meets the criteria of an accessory dwelling unit, so therefore it's a conditional use hearing, and um, letters were sent to neighbors and uh, was publicly noticed. Um, this uh, pool house will also have a swimming pool and um, they are wanting to, we do now have a swimming pool requirement which is a permitted use, it's not a conditional use, but because this is a relatively new um, um, addition to our zoning code, I would like council's input on the um, type of protective cover that they want to use in lieu of a regular fencing that would go around. Um, so anyway, as far as the accessory dwelling unit goes, again, um, they, um, they met the lot coverage. They are far enough away from the side um, yard and way far away from the rear and the um, front, obviously. <clears throat> so they, the, the height of the dwelling unit is uh, 10 feet, uh, the size um, does not exceed the maximum allowed. Um, I think that's pretty much it, yeah. And I think my only concern with and what I would like to hear a little bit more, um, obviously if there's anybody that has any concerns. I also want to make sure, like the lighting, um, the direct cutoff fixtures, illum illuminating uh, from the, any uh, reflections from the pool also um, needs to be reflected away from the adjoining properties, um, as well as talking about the, the pool cover. Okay, so do we want to hear from the applicant? Sure. Okay. Um, do you have anything to add you want to say? Uh, okay, so um, do we have any questions for the applicant or Denise before we open well, up? I, I guess I have a couple questions in terms of the pool cover. Because right now, do we have a requirement with the pool that you have a fence? Yeah, we, we never ever had anything before, and as you know, we added that in. Um, it says, or other protective device. Sure. Yeah, so we have that that other protective okay, device so that's and this really kind of fall that definitely falls under that um, part of the pool house itself and the house itself can it can also be a part of the barrier mm -hmm. around that pool um, but yes the pool the pool cover is as I included the information on that it's a new technology I don't know how council feels about that or if they still would prefer to have some fencing uh, it's well the question I have and, and, and I guess it's for um, you is uh, so obviously there's a switch that you or something that will cause the cover to go to retract and then to go back. Where is that switch? A keypad with a code. Okay, and where is that located? Okay, because uh, you know I, I don't have so much of a problem when I was reading with you know that you can stand on this cover, but you know I guess my biggest concern is young children. Because I feel like once you're bigger, you sort of know what you're doing and, and things will happen. But it's young kids. So I was thinking about, okay, adults are really good about pushing the button or whatever to get it to close. But if you had then a bunch of kids that are out swimming in that and um, they're sort of in charge and then what happens if they don't close it? Then you have, where a fence, you always have that right there. So, so the issue with that can you come up to the mic, please? The, the issue that this addresses that a fence doesn't is when, it's, when the fence is incorporated to the house, which is the way ours would be if we were required to have a fence, is kids can still come through the house. Sure. So the advantage of this is at one touch in 45 seconds it closes and it's a personal, like a four pin keypad. So you keep that secret, nobody can get into it. Yeah. I was wondering, does it, uh, 
does it have like a motion detector or something like that? It, so that it if, does. if you forget to key it off, does it automatically? It, it doesn't. Uh, for safety reasons, because you don't want it to close somebody in underneath. The floor. <laughs> but you also don't want to forget to close. It. You don't uh, right. like forgetting to close a gate. Right. Same thing. And so, so the you know the listed advantages. There's a lot of material on it. Most codes are starting well, to the allow. Gates, it. I think technically have to be self-closing. Technically. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I mean, there, there's a lot of material on it. Most most municipalities are starting to allow mm -hmm. them um, because they actually consider them safer than fences because they completely close the water barrier to the outside. So there's no. Um, intrinsic I want I see the water I want to get in it so mm -hmm. we've been pool owners before we had a fence attached to our house our kids were a lot younger than we worried every single day about them getting through that door so we're actually much more comfortable with this as a barrier we truly don't want any well, unless right. somebody knows the code sure they can't come in, in the middle of the night and go swimming in your pool that's correct the neighbors are upset about that right. <laughs> um, I don't think that this is a zoning issue I think that our zoning code is clear that we require a fence or a protective device. That's where it lays. The real issue is with either the health department or the building department as to whether or not they're going to allow this as a protective device. Um, and I don't know which, probably the building department. Um, yeah, I don't know if the building department, it would have to be the building department because the health department doesn't regulate um, private pools anymore. If they had did it one time, they don't anymore. Okay. And so that's why we put it into the zoning code. The only thing that they regulate now are uh, public. Well, um, I mean, it's a life safety issue. Mm -hmm. And yeah. zoning codes aren't going to delve into life safety issues. You know, that's what the building code is all about. Um, you know, so I think, frankly, as long as it meets one of these two criteria, we we're good to go. Okay. I, I think it falls within the the code the what we added, you know, um, to the zoning code it or other protective device, um, and you know it we we do have pools in town that don't have fences, correct, and. <laughs> Um, and was that before there yes. was a? Okay. Yeah, we. This is the first time we've actually used this. So it's exciting. Um, so I, I'm in favor of it. Um, okay, I'm going to open the public hearing if that's okay with you guys. Thank you. Okay, I'm opening the public hearing. Um, uh, if. You know, you have three minutes, come up to the mic, state your name. Um, and this is for the pool and the pool house. Wait, can I get a clarification on that? Uh, is the pool permitted in the pool house? Is the conditional use? The conditional use is for the pool house. Thank yes, you. the conditional use is for the pool house. If anyone wants to talk about fence versus, uh, well, so yeah, but I think you just made a determination that the, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. you're good on the protective covering. So the only issue at hand right now is the pool, pool house. Okay, thank you. Does anyone have, can you come up? Okay. Yes, <clears throat> my name is Ted Barker and I live next door. And my thoughts are the pool house and not the pool is the pool house a permanent use 12 month a year uh, house or is a, a conditional use for swing people only uh, as i looked at it the house it looks like it's a year-round type permanent structure uh, made for year-round use and not for just summer swimming that type of thing i don't know so I, that's what i need to find out thank you yeah. yeah, it's a accessory dwelling units, and they are a year-round structure. So, my question is, how does that impact on surrounding housing? Meaning, you're building okay. you're building a house, two houses on one lot. Uh, you're building an accessory dwelling unit. What's the difference between an accessory and a permanent house? Well, I'm not sure as far as building codes, maybe. Ted, you can answer that, but it is yes, definitely Ted. in size. It's not. It can only be 66% of the 
Yeah, and it, it sounds in the like rewrite, I'll give you history. In the rewrite of the zoning code, mm -hmm. every lot in town is permitted to have an accessory structure and or an accessory dwelling unit, which does in fact give everybody the right to have two residences on each lot. There are restrictions regarding how that access, what qualifies it as an accessory versus a primary structure. The house is the primary structure and utilities have to go through the house to the accessory dwelling unit or the accessory structure. So that's what classifies it as, but in all intent and purposes, it is another house on the lot. That also the size, it has to be no bigger than 800 square feet or half of the existing primary structure, whichever is smaller, I think. Which can and, be used full time. Yes. 24-7. Yes. Yes. It can be rented out. Rented out. It can be mm -hmm. a granny apartment. Um, can be permanently rented. It can be there for when people have relatives to come or whatever. Yeah, and it comes through us so that we see the plan and we make sure and staff make sure that it follow it um, uh, makes all of those conditions meets all of those conditions. But so. someone could live there at 365. Yes. As long as it meets the conditions, it is conditionally allowed. Okay. Thank you. So can it be Airbnb? Would you, here, can no, someone? Um, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm curious, can that uh, accessory residence then can you rent it out like Airbnb, which is very popular these days? And I'm sorry, yes. can you give your name, please? Uh, Patrick Heminger. Thank you. I'm, all, I'm a couple of doors up on Orton Road. Um, yes, you can. Yeah, uh, council actually just recently um, passed an ordinance about short-term rentals. So. Um, we had a long discussion here. We made a recommendation to council just recently about that, and the decision by council was. It's, it has a, a definition now. It's yeah. Tra transit guest lodging. Um, gotcha. 30, it has to be less than 30 days. Um, it is basically a short term rental. But and just, to, just to clarify, registered <laughs> with us. that would be a different hearing. That would be a different hearing, yes. Yeah. They haven't uh, applied to do that, but if it's a long-term rental, they're allowed to do that, as long as the utilities go through the main house. So if at any point they want to use that as a what is often called Airbnb, they would have to come back to Planning Commission. And you would be notified? Right? Well, no, not anymore. They used to have to come oh, back to Planning Commission. Okay, I'm yes. sorry. It's a permitted yes. use now. Yes. They have to be registered. We, yeah. They have okay. to be registered. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. We were asking for it to be, yeah. Okay. Just so. register, me just file a form, and Correct. then they yeah. can do it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And pay taxes. You pay a lodging tax. Yes, mm -hmm. and they pay a lodging well, tax. Well, I think we can. <laughs> Thank you. I'll just say that when the council passed that, it passed me. I'm sorry. I wasn't aware that I was already a legal thing to build a second house on a property. It's interesting because um, when I was looking at the past zoning code, accessory dwelling units were even in the old code, but they didn't have quite the number of regulations that they do now, um, specifically being they can't be separately metered. Um, they used to be able to be. And oftentimes people would then carve those out into other lots, and you, you find that around town. Um, it wasn't, I did find it in the, prior to the 2013 code. Um, now, um, excess, the, the, the Airbnb thing is a, another layer um, where you can use that, and as Ted said, it's just simply, a, it is a registration process, and then you have a tax, a lodging tax. Um, I, I'll say a little, as a council member, most people I think in the village know that the issue of affordability 
has come up as one of the most important issues right now. And clearly housing, it's housing costs that is the big driver of that. So uh, the village government uh, is, has really been encouraging people to build accessory dwelling units, particularly for long-term rental. The issue of Airbnb could become an issue. Maybe it already has. And if it has, then I think it has to come back to Planning Commission and Council to, to revisit it. But given that historically the village has not wanted to expand its borders, uh, the reason why housing has become so expensive is because people want to live here and we have the market at work. So if we can have infill development, which is what uh, accessory dwelling unit is, hopefully that can help absorb some of the uh, need for moderate rental units. Th th this particular structure isn't necessarily that. It uh, has other purpose, I guess, but. The intent of this is to completely be a piece of our home. So our home um, only has three bedrooms. We have two kids and us. Um, so it gives us a spare bedroom and a spare family room. And, and if you look at the site plan, the way it's incorporated, the intent is um, no long-term rentals. Yes, we'll have guests that stay there. Um, who does with it when we don't own that house anymore? I don't know. <laughs> um, but, but I think everybody knows you can Airbnb a bedroom in your house too. So um, I think that issue you guys will have to deal with at some point. That's true. Ken Strewing, uh, one of the things I'd like for you to address, Denise, is you talk about the metering, and I think a lot of people are not necessarily understanding of, of what you're talking about. I mean, uh, you're talking about separate the sewer from for that dwelling, or for this uh, this case, um, um, the sewer has to come from the house, can't can't be attached to the to the uh, to the village system uh, directly. Water has to come from the house, can't come from the village system directly, Correct. as does the electric. So and I think one of the concerns that some of the people have that have, that have expressed their concern to me is that is the accessory, how many accessory buildings can be built on a piece of property. So I think possibly explaining that to people um, cl clearer would help out. So. Yeah, um, accessory dwelling units, you can only have one accessory dwelling unit, and it can only be for a... Uh, single family dwelling, and that is in your residential districts. Um, only one unit. Only one accessory dwelling unit, yeah. and it has to. You can't put an accessory dwelling unit with a, a with a two family, or a single family attached or apartment building. It can only be with a single family dwelling, and it can only be one one accessory dwelling unit. Can you come up, please? Matt Barker, we live next door to these people. Uh, to put it crassly, I think what a lot of us are concerned about is what does it do to our property values? I know you can only offer an opinion, but I'd like to hear it. It would increase them. Seriously? Yeah. When the, state, when the county auditor goes to re-audit that property, they're going to value it for having that accessory dwelling unit and up that property value pretty significantly. Happened to me last week. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I think you're concerned about your property yeah. value. And, and as, as far as I know, first of all, I think if you've been around Yellow Springs, you know you have half million dollar houses beside $150,000 houses. As far as I know, there has never been anything demonstrated, unless you have a house that's clearly deteriorating, that a neighboring property is decreasing the neighbor's property. So this is, I, I, I truly can't imagine that this would decrease your property value. Really? Any other uh, citizens' comments? Okay, I'm going to um, close the public hearing and bring it back to us.
I have one question for the applicant. Um, on the site plan, you show a, a boundary around the pool that connects to the accessory dwelling unit. Is that a new fence, or is it just some landscaping features? Uh, show me. Uh -huh. Uh, this is a, a concrete firm that matches this. It's basically a bench. Okay. Did, did we answer Ken Stewart's question? Did I? Was I oblivious to that? Yes. Did we answer that? Okay. I don't have any questions. Um, do we hear? Well, did you? Did you have? A, we don't have a motion. Have a motion. <laughs> you can close the public hearing. I already did that. Okay. I move approval of the um, conditional use request for the pool house accessory dwelling unit. I'll second that. Okay. Styles. Yes. Dino. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Doden. Yes. Pelzo. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, we're gonna take how much? Five minute break. A uh, five minute break. Um, we're gonna do some old business after the break. Okay. But Ken is building. So. Oh. Okay. He was putting their minds at ease. Okay. okay, now we get into the weeds. Yes. Okay. okay. So okay. next we're doing minimum lot frontages. Yay. Denise? So there's this section of the code that says any lot created after the effective date of this code shall have frontage on an improved public street or approved private street or access easement equal to the minimum required lot width in the zoning district in which it is located. Um, in the past, when I've, we had one particular um, property that came up with this issue, um, I worked with um, Jessica and we came up with the idea that um, it had to basically, um, the access easement, if it was a shared driveway, what, you know, from the front to the back, that that, that lot, that was, this was actually a lot that already exists, existed. We weren't creating a lot, which is maybe a little bit different than what this is saying. Um, that that particular one needed to at least have frontage on that lot, on that one, that, that landlocked lot, and it did. So they did a access easement shared driveway from the lot in the front to get to the landlocked lot in the back, which was ex Exhibit A. Um, if you can see, that, then the easement basically ran along that section of the 109.49 feet, and they had to have 40 feet of frontage, and they had 41.02 before it ends, <clears throat> so they had just enough. Um, to be able to get access this uh, this property here, which is landlocked, this one right here, which is landlocked, yeah, that property. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. in between the two, it's it's in between a. Are you on B like, two there? Exhibit A, Children's and so Center. this is their how they yeah that big forty one point oh two. Next time um, we get printouts from GIS, can we put lot numbers on it? Sure, please. Um, so that one's already been approved. That one, yes. Okay, I have a that question. was yeah, and that was a, that was an existing landlocked lot that they just and he owned both of the properties, so he just put an easement to be able to get to that one in the back to unlock it. To unlock and it. And so the mm -hmm. easement is, I guess, is this area right here? No, it's on the red. It's on the red. It's an easement. You can't see it. Oh, okay, I mean, an easement there. So we can't see it, but it's no. right there. But he had he he had to make it 20 feet wide because um, utilities wanted five feet. We made a, like a 12 to 15 foot driveway, and the utilities wanted two to three feet on each side for water sewer. They wanted it to be separate, going to the back, going to that landlocked lot. 
I'm getting confused then because I, I read about the 20 feet because this says equal to minimum required lot width. Yes. Right. And the zoning. So the zoning what is the minimum lot 40 width? 40 there. 40. So wouldn't the easement have to be 40 feet then? It, he had 40 feet of frontage on the, on on, his, on the lot and he has 41.02. Oh, he does. Okay. On Gore Street. Okay. But the easement just has to be a right of way sort of easement, like kind of access easement. Yeah, access. but I mean, well, where is that 40 feet? Is that 40 feet has to go to? It's right here. here. That's all it has to be. It's actually. It has to go all the way from the street, though. It had to go all the way from the street. Okay, so then. So it really had to go 109.49 feet and 40 feet. Okay. So it should have cut this red um, So then it goes down half. here then, right? So right. To yes. Corey Street. Okay, that's the thing yeah. I was questioning. So that's also fine. goes down here. Okay. So basically, okay. so, so the ease, so here was right. the, the easement was like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. So what are you saying about that? <laughs> well, okay, so that's one Question. example. Let me just yeah. kind of okay. give you the different examples. That, that was what up. was necessary to get access to that. That already existing that lot. lot. Right. That's an already existing lot. Okay. The second, Exhibit B on Livermore Street. You have to have 60-foot frontage. Does not. He has, if you look behind the red lot, the red marked lot directly behind it, he has a little lot, 64.50 by 91. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It has 60 feet, if we're interpreting it that way, it has the 60 feet of frontage. Now, yeah. if, you, if you do a uh, multiplier of the size of that lot. Wait a minute, stop right there. It does not have 60 foot of frontage because that property line, 60 feet, is not on the public right of way. Right, no, but if you did wide. an access easement off of Livermore, a, a road that goes back there, he, he, he would have that 60 feet. Is there an access easement? There isn't now. Okay. I mean, he's asking. He wants to do that. Okay. But he also has enough property on Livermore that he could make that 60 feet for that piece. Right. Yes. And he still be within the proper... Uh, Frontage, uh, with, because there's 100 and almost 200 feet there. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and actually, Denise, in your writing about Exhibit B, you, and maybe this was just a typo, you said that the lot was on Livermore was 119.75. Oh, I'm sorry. And. Um, it's 199. Oh, okay, because that's another one. That's, sorry, that's actually, I must have been thinking about the one on Allen Street. Yeah, mm -hmm. so he has 100. So the reason I had Exhibit B, the, if you see Exhibit B2, the other option that he could technically do, I think, Ted, you had mentioned this. Um, he could technically go 60 feet off uh, if you look at B2, he could go 60 feet and then go in and then go back to that 60 feet, and then he wouldn't have to own any of that. He, he would be basically making, that person would own that, yes. Yeah. Weirdly shaped parcel. Right. And the width of that, if, if it becomes, well, let me, let me go back. There's nothing in our code that dictates what the shape of a lot is. No. You can have property lines that go any which way you want. It can be curved. It, it can be anything it wants. What we dictate is frontage, access, and the reason for the frontage, minimum frontage within a residential district is to maintain density issues in that district. So they're defined by frontage. Then they're defined by size of lot. So those two things combined are what's minimum to create a lot. If somebody has a large parcel and they want to subdivide it, as long as they can get frontage on the, on the main drag, on the public right-of-way, then they can have any shape they want. 
So the, what dictates the width and they have to be able to maintain setbacks. So the, if they want to narrow that frontage down to a lane, that lane has to meet the minimum setbacks, side yard setbacks in combination for the width to meet the side yard setbacks. Yeah. So in the district, if the, the combined setbacks are 25 feet, 15 and 10 maybe or whatever, but combined setbacks are 25 feet, then that's got to be the minimum <coughs> lane width to get to the flag. That's how it would be interpreted. So, so this, the Livermore Street one could be 60 feet, narrow to 20 or whatever it it's is. It's 20 because it's 10 at yeah. max. And then go back. On both sides. And then be whatever it wants. Um, I, I'm sort of missing something. Mm -hmm. Why, and, and comparing it to the uh, one on Corey Street, which allowed what that that was an easement that went back there. So why can't they just put an easement back to this property? Given he just doesn't want to own the land. He doesn't want to maintain. He doesn't want to own the land, and he doesn't want to maintain a big road like that, a big long road. Got it. Responsible for it. Got it. And everything else. Right. Okay. So this one, the B, which has the the B one or whatever it is, that had. Yeah, B2. It has this strange little thing. But this is actually would be their drive, how they yeah. access there. And yeah, so, so, but they wouldn't be responsible yeah. for maintaining no, they it. Are, they are. Yeah. Oh, they this would. Is a lot. Yeah. So, so this is what on B, what he would have to do is maintain this 60 feet, and then he could narrow it to 20. Well, I'm talking about that. this one. I know, but because of what that is, mm -hmm. this, sort of applying that logic to, yep. to this, to um, that way this house is separate from Why not this. just make it a flag lot and have the width be 25 feet away? Yeah, that's what, because it, doesn't because it has to have 60 feet. So what? Right. at the street. It has to be 60 foot at the street. minimum but, on a well, street. But, but truly, what difference is that going to make? I mean, if we're going to make a lot back here, what difference is it going to make whether it and this is actually an existing own, lot so whether they own like 60 it, feet of the frontage and then we do this gerrymandering thing to get it smaller and then bigger because as he, opposed he to just sell that much of the no no i'm saying why not make a flag lot and just have the new the owner at that yeah, land lot what does have to be 60 here. down here why yeah, but, because that's because the requirement the zoning why process. why do we have that requirement why don't we change yeah. that requirement so because the 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 zoning code so we changed that requirement because of what ted said about maintaining obviously this is a way to get around sort of the reason for that right but the thing is we don't have the only requirements for the shape of a of a property line is the setbacks we could add requirements but this is not this is not breaking any rules. Yeah, but we can have a rule that says if you have a landlocked parcel, you can have a flag lot with a 20 whatever road that you own that goes back to that lot. Then it's and then only for landlocked parcels. Existing landlocked parcels. Then you would have to go back to the zoning code and change every district to allow 20 wow. foot of frontage in every district. For, I for, mean, but for then any landlocked parcels. No. It, no, that's what I'm saying. Only for landlocked parcels. Frontage is parcels. frontage. Yeah. Frontage is frontage. You can you can call it whatever you want, but an access road easement isn't frontage. It's doesn't re, it, it's not frontage. So we would have to redef put a new definition to each district on what we would require as minimum frontage. For for, because uh, anyone for could do that. Landlocked what, parcels. But what we're saying is like a landlocked parcel could be that really opens up what's I mean if we it, don't do that could, then we're gonna have this gerrymandering thing, which is ridiculous, I think. But uh, but it would then permit, for example, me selling off the back half of my 
property, okay. creating a landlocked parcel, and then doing that, Great. which then would happen all over the place, which... Well, it wouldn't happen all over the place, but yeah, to the degree it's in, it, that's, it could. Good. that's what Any we want. Any person could then do it, and that is a major shift in the thinking around why the zoning code does what it does, so that's... Well, I mean, you, we have to have a major shift in our thinking if we're going to well, deal with if, affordable if that, housing. If that's the case, then we have to make the argument that we eliminate the density in districts and have one residential district with a 20-foot frontage, period. And that that's a discussion that is much broader than what we have here. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I'm because, not opposed to that in oh, theory. I mean, um, but, but like to solve well let me let me just say let's put a pin in that for a second and just go to exhibit c because now that takes you kind of to that next thing that she was bringing up exhibit c and chris till is here he actually is the owner of this for some reason um the <laughs> these were platted out at 25 that's, that's what they did i don't in know the, why uh, but well, that's what it I'm was not sure in why. part of town so, you know, what Chris would like to do, right now, Chris technically, I guess, could do a, a an access easement. He could do a replat, replatting the three parcels into two with a road access easement, possibly. He, but, but he's, if you think he could do that. Um, because the frontage that he needs to have is 50 feet. So he, if you replatted that, he'd have 75 feet frontage. And he would, he wanted, to, he has all this room in the back that could be another lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he could do an uh, access easement off of that 75 foot frontage. And do 20 feet uh, on that. On, I think it's all. It, I think he has to have a total of 15 actually in that for both okay. sides in residential B, and then um, he has the 50 foot frontage. Um, he'd have to have the 50 foot frontage in in the lot in the back. Um, what he couldn't do, but I think he'd like to do, is kind of what Marianne is saying, and is have a flag lot. Yeah, I mean that's what he's asked me, which. You know, it can't. We can't do that. We don't have that in the code. And we, we may not have, want to have, have it. Have a flag lot, which is the 25. Foot yeah, we don't have. To the back. Right, we don't. We don't have that in the code. So, so is the question. Uh, I understand the flag lot is raising a flag, <laughs> but uh, he, he could do an access easement and then split off a back. Is that he could do that? That, well, right. it's how we're interpreting. I mean, if you want. I mean, but we need, but it's supposed to have. In what? order to do, in order to create a lot, you have to have an access easement, according to the way this is reading. Yeah. That's uh, equal to the, the minimum. According to the way that this is reading, it says that equal to the access easement, equal to minimum required lot width. Yeah. Right. If. So if the district says the minimum frontage is 50 feet, he has to find 50 feet on that 75 feet yeah. times two, which means he can't do it to create a flag lot. Mm -hmm. Said another way that the, the question would be, okay, because an, an easement can be shared. Yes. So it, it, we're not, this the way this is written, one can argue that it doesn't allow shared or overlap. Because, because, yeah. it would be front, because, because it's a it new be, lot. Because it would be joint. Yeah. It would be, you know, it, it, an easement could be jointly used. Yeah. So with 75 feet, you could have 50 and then a 25 foot access easement plus the other 25. But the question would be is whether or not the code comp contemplates that as it is currently written. So why can't you have an access easement that goes straight back along the eastern side and curves and probably goes all the way over, goes west, and it's a curved access easement, and you get 50 feet? Because it's not frontage on the right-of-way. Well, we're not, you don't have to have frontage on the right-of-way. Yes, you have you to do. have frontage on the access easement. No. Well, then how well, come we, yeah, how I mean, come Quarry Street was okay? That 
landlocked parcel didn't doesn't have yeah on the a yeah, 40, right 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 to the access easement here here's the 40 feet right here yeah it's not on the road well see i wouldn't certainly i don't interpret it as being permissible but <laughs> it was or, i mean i guess it was was it permitted so Exhibit A yeah. was permitted, no, correct? What Denise showed for A, I thought she showed the easement was right here. It, is. Yeah. it runs this whole length. Yeah, so but that, what yeah. it's saying is that the property itself has to have 40 feet along the access easement. And here it is, right here. Okay. So I'm so saying just have an access easement, easement for him. Of course. And, and it had to have 40 feet here on Corey. No. Yes. The easement, yes. Well, yes. oh, the easement itself? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. So it did mean, but the plenty. easement isn't 40 feet, but you mean it has to be... But it goes to... This easement on Quarry Street, it is only is 20 feet yeah, at not Quarry Street, feet. right? Yes, and that yeah. was not, that was not a creating of a lot. Feet, that was but the a, easement that was is a, just already an existing lot. lot and yeah, so that's an existing that. lot. That exist this yet. is creating a new lot. So that was solving a problem of a landlocked lot. On winter on Centra College, this would be us. You'd be setting this would a new be creating a new precedent. landlocked lot. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, with the access easement. Do we want to talk about Exhibit D before Chris? Obviously, has been raising his hand, but I don't know if we're ready to open the public hearing. Um, D was uh, sorry. <laughs> okay, this she wanted to create a. Uh, she wanted to create, the question was how much frontage, it's, frontage did she have to create a lot in the back of the property? Yeah, and, and she that. wanted and she wanted to be able to have it be um, like Separate exhibit utilities. B to where you kind of go uh, and then back and then back to that. But the problem is you have to have um, if she I mean she wanted to be separate, so then you'd have to have 120 because this is an RA. So you'd have to have 60 and 60. Yeah, and okay. she doesn't have enough frontage. But the question then becomes, can that person go for a variance of two and a half feet? Mm -hmm. I think there would be a pretty legitimate argument that they could. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's. It, I think that there's some gray area regarding the frontage. And I'm not trying to make an argument for whether we should or should not allow flag lots. I'm, I'm simply interpreting the code as it's written and what it would take to change that code if we wanted to do away with minimum lot frontages per lot. Because that is a huge issue in the zoning code. Well, if we set that aside, the flag lot thing, um, can we come back to the access easement thing. Because to me, Exhibit C, uh, access easement creating another lot. I don't see that we have any way through the statement that every lot has a minimum frontage requirement. Are there minutes for this? Dimension by dimension. Because it would, well, this require, would, this it would require 100 for the two lots, correct. and there's only 75. Correct. I think it was. I don't think. I mean, it says after this. Not with an access code, easement. But it has. No. I think it may have even. Access would more. require 50. And so the could the access easement add. actually come back and then turn, and then they would have 50 feet of frontage on the access easement for a lot back there. That's the only way to get that, or, you know. That Did would this be statement silly. appear before? You mean prior to, prior to the 2013? I, I don't know why I keep thinking it did, but. I've never, I mean, in my experience, I mean, my experience has been to interpret frontage exactly what I said. Mm -hmm. in, everywhere I've worked, it doesn't matter. And See, and so, I totally agree with you on the fact that 
with on the with the fact that it, if you're separating them out as its own lot, I think where I'm hung up on is if it's an access easement and the person in the front owns every bit of it. What and as long as they have the frontage, then would it mean the same? I think that's applicable to districts that permit doubles. Well, well, if they own or higher density per lot, but on RA, a single family residential lot, it's different than RB, which allows doubles and quads or whatever higher densities. So that's where I think that applies. Well, I mean, this really, this if we were to do stuff like this, this would pretty much eliminate accessory dwelling units. No, like, because right? you could you could you overlay you this property this? with a pocket neighborhood. And still, and develop it into four or five accessory dwelling units. So, I don't know that that is an accessory dwelling unit. You could easily. Well, before do that. five, before what five. What I'm saying is, dwelling. would people want to do this instead of making an accessory dwelling unit, separate their property into two lots, mm -hmm. if it if they have enough property and create a second lot that they don't necessarily you know that they could part with and then it wouldn't be the same owner i mean there there's obviously a reason that chris doesn't want to you know like i, don't, I guess i have a question chris do you have any comments on yeah this? please come on sure no three minutes no no, you have longer than that. Well, yeah, you can have more. We're asking you questions. Okay. I got seven <laughs> handouts, so who can share? Who's <laughs> going to share? Judy and I will share. Can we share? Look at that. We're good at sharing. <laughs> oh, he's wanting to. Yeah, I told Judy she'd get two. Look, I was right. I'm going to keep Hi, everybody. Hi. I'm Chris Till. I've lived in town for 20 years, which is surprising. I feel like I'm a, <laughs> I'm a newcomer, but I came here 20 years ago. And I'm here to advocate for flag lots. I believe that flag lots should be explicitly permitted in the zoning code. Allowing flag lots would create instantly more, potentially more buildable lots in the village. It would allow uh, a natural population increase without having to crack the eggshell of the village limits and perhaps maybe some people will be nice and build some affordable houses in uh, on their flag lots the handout actually is a textbook example of a flag lot and it's my house uh, as you can see for whatever reason that neighborhood was split up into 25 foot sections 80 or 90 years ago phil hockey told me he thought maybe they were originally going to build uh, more uh, than that, row houses there or something like that who knows so we got a huge yard it's, it's 75 by 162, so it's, it's over 12,000 square feet. It's nice to have such a big yard, but we don't use it. We've got a little piece of the back fenced in for the kids to use. Um, and, and, and this, what I'm proposing is, is, I know Denise had some various examples of flag lots. This would be sort of like a textbook example of a flag lot, what I'm proposing. I don't know if everyone can see the... You know, it's something like this, oh, where there's 20 okay. foot frontage off the street, where it's where it's resurveyed, it's replanted, uh -huh. 20 foot access off the street, leading to the the larger lot in the back. Um, I'm sure everyone already knows what a flag lot is, but just to be clear, yeah. uh, it, it's an unusually shaped lot. As Ted said, lots can be any size. Typically, they're rectangular, though. But a flag lot has a it's shaped like a flagpole because yeah. there's a little yeah. piece of frontage to the street and then. A big spot and bag. Yeah. Now it yeah, could be done with easements. Kind of sure, I'm a lawyer. I'll write up an easement. Great, no problem. But the pract I think, uh, in practicality, I, you know, I was involved, called in. People fight over easements. Neighbors have problems. Someone wants to put a fence up over the easement. Well, the guy who won't, he can put a fence there. It just it creates hassles. So, uh, the number one ideal would be to, uh, you know, just replant and create an actual flag lot, not not easements and whatnot. Um, what I'm proposing here, it, it satisfies everything in the zoning code except 
minimum lot frontage. And my reading of the zoning code is exactly what Ted's is. With, it's not tricky what it says about minimum lot frontages. It's, it's, it's plain. Uh, but what I'm proposing here, it satisfies the you know, minimum lot size. Each lot would be over 6,000 square feet. It satisfies all the front and the side setback issues. Uh, now there's some particulars when you really get down to think about it, you know, that, that's a little bit complicated. In general, I think some people are probably already favored. They're like, great, let's do it. We get more lots. Maybe somebody will build some affordable houses. Maybe not, but we'll, we can do some building in town. But there's some funky little details that, that you all will, will discover uh, with uh, especially setback issues. Uh, how, how is a setback measured? You know, on my lot, well, what I'm proposing here, if you can, a little cross-hatched little area down there, that's, you know, that's, what is it, 32 by 38 feet or something like that, just a proposed building footprint, but... Um, that's what would be allowed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's smaller than allowed, but you, you just see where is the front setback measured from or the rear uh -huh. setback. Yeah. It, it's more like a, now a, a perpendicular lot. Hmm. And, and you, you, you want it to make sense. You don't want to be forced into reading your front and back setbacks from the street. So then you get this funny little, you know, long rectangular shaped thing. So whoever, Chris, if he's going to be the one that writes this code, it's kind of complicated how you're going to write in uh, setbacks. Uh, how setbacks are measured. I, I'm not proposing changing any of the setbacks. The ideal would be to, to, to change the absolute minimum of the zoning codes. You're not rewriting it. You're not rewriting the setbacks, all this stuff. It's, it's the minimum. It's the access lane. You can call it minimum, minimum frontage, but it's, it's that access lane. How wide does it have to be? Off well, the I, street. I, off the street, yeah. yeah. I mean, driveways are typically maybe... 12 or 14 feet or something like that. Uh, you want, you know, utilities want a few feet coming in off there. So, okay, you want at least 15 or 17 feet, something like that. I did mine 20 because I thought, well, people aren't going to argue with it as much. And that's what actually fits here to satisfy the setbacks off my existing garage right here. Mm -hmm. Now, I think this should be put in the, in the zoning code explicitly because landowners have to have reasonable expectations of what they can do with their property. I talked to Doug Sutton, big surveyor around here, and you know, it costs him, it would cost land order about a thousand, two thousand dollars to get their land resurveyed and replatted. So you don't want people just doing that and finding out, oh no, you, you can't build it. Uh, so I think it's more than just landlocked lots that need to be addressed. Certainly those are the obvious ones that need to be addressed. Um, but, but it's not just, uh, but not just landlocked lots. There is, besides the examples that uh, Denise provided, I mean, the main example of a flag lot in town here is on Orton Street. I mean, the oh, Gunsman's yeah. property yeah. is a classic yeah. flag lot, yeah. you know, um, and it's gorgeous. Yeah. But unfortunately, I don't have. There are some on the street. Well, I'd like to say, as a council person, and as a council person working on housing, you know, one of the things we're going to be looking at. Council. I mean, the Housing Advisory Board is going to be coming to Council <laughs> recommending some strategies. <coughs> well, we already have been, we, the Village Government Planning, has been making uh, accessory dwelling units more uh, easily available to people. I want to suggest that Planning Commission take on studying the issue of flag lots you know, the pros and the cons and what it would look like because that would be another strategy to increase the, well, like Chris was saying. And it's a, not something we're going to do tonight. So when you say flag lots, you're meaning to Just decrease the minimum frontage. To yeah. have a, I, I, I'm, I'm not an attorney and I'm not a zoning expert, but clearly there must be a way to have in the code the ability for people to do flag lots, just like this, just like the other one. I don't know how it would be done, but there must be something that's not too, too difficult. But that's not the point, how difficult it is. The point is, do we want it? What are the pros, what are the cons? Is that, does it make sense for this to be a strategy? And I don't know, it seems like planning, 
this is some this is planning commission might be the place well to planning commission i i would have to make a i think a detailed argument for if we were to bring that pass that on to council to put into our zoning code because i i really wouldn't want this to be something that surprised people oh no that's what i'm saying this, we're not solving this tonight but, we're not solving yeah, no, it this I, month i know it's but a, like what i'm saying is that the you know if we do all this work all i'm saying is that that it wouldn't just be a tax amendment it would be like a more ed, it's a study in, yeah robust. yeah more robust um uh, recommendation because this would I mean I'm I'm definitely not opposed to it on face value um, yet I don't but there is a lot of um, you know people have been making replatting decisions based on this for years and to change the zoning code in this way it could be a very easy text amendment to make but um, it's a big change well I'll you yeah. know I would go back to it zoning has zoning regulations are based on community intent for what they want right so I personally think I'm all in favor of creating flag lots in any district, personally. So I'm not trying to argue against that. What I'm trying to argue for is we have a zoning code that's written, it's established, it's new, it has community buy-in, it has fire protection buy-in, it has emergency vehicle buy-in, it has trash delivery, you know, pickup buy-in, it has water utilities and sewer buy-in it has all these elements that consider why a lot has frontage and why it exists those those things are what drives the intent of zoning it's not affordable housing right it's not being able to cram more crap into the bag that's not the intent i'm not saying it shouldn't be because i think our code really breaks a lot of those barriers that other zoning codes don't do and we have done a great job of getting community buy-in to get it to where it is. And my only fear is that we've, we've seen a little bit of it tonight. You know, it's, we've gotten buy-in and we've got it passed, and how, how much can we push that envelope one more step? Do I think that this would get through? Probably so. Um, I think it's a great idea. But, you know, there are some issues you know, relative sure. to trash collection and, you know, all of the emergency vehicle access, all those mm -hmm. things. Well, also, if you're putting a house back there, right, like the houses that are built next door have, they have an understanding of what the lots are around them and where windows are going to be and stuff like that. I think privacy is a, is a big thing for this. That's because, the other issue around You know, if you're not facing your house towards the street, where are you facing it? I can cut up this lot different ways that we could cut it up. So if, if that's a concern, I'll cut it up so it faces the street. Yeah. And there's, it, it, there's, there's no, 12, you're 000. cutting it up to face <coughs> your, house. your house. Yeah. But, you know, well, yeah, we, we okay, think, right, right, right. I don't right, think yeah. we should yeah. be getting into the argument. Well, this, this, yeah. this is a big yeah. issue. Yeah, yeah this it is, is a big issue. issue. Yeah. And I have, I, like, these are four real examples. Yeah. I mean, yeah. real time yeah. examples. Um, ex uh, with the uh, Exhibit D, I mean, I get calls. I'll, I'll get a call again from Exhibit D after this meeting wondering what is the decision on that and on um, what I'm hearing is it's possible in that case uh, if they go for a variance for the two and a half feet that they might be able to then carve off 60 feet or 57 feet and, and create a lot in the back yeah. um, within the zoning code as it stands right. now yeah right but you know but with that with the variance yeah, with a variance. Shooting that down, I don't know. If I could address Rosa's concern of privacy, 
well, I, I could conditionally build an accessory dwelling back there, and I don't yeah. think that makes a difference which way that's pointing. Right. The downside of accessory dwellings for me is I don't think I'm going to be able to get that loan. Yeah. You know, I could get the loan conditioned on selling my house. I mean, what we want to do yeah. is sell our house and build a house back there and live in that one. Yeah. But, you know, accessory dwelling is great, but I don't think I'm going to be able to get, get the loan. And, and as far as the, the entire the code not involved in affordable housing, well, let me, I was in the let me, let me make a mention of that. Um, I think that there are more flexible ways to get, it's basically like a, con, a land contract. So you can, you can still own a single property, you can have a land contract on a portion of that property on a single family and still maintain that ownership and get by some of those regs mm -hmm. for, for financing. And financing isn't on our plate. Sure, but, I understand. But that. there are options there, I just don't want to, you know. Right. I did want to add on to what you were saying about, uh, I was on the planning commission uh, as a, uh, what was I, an auxiliary member during the, when the zoning code was rewritten a few years ago, and affordable housing was part of the conversation when uh, the, the frontages were cut down. That was due to, well, people built smaller houses when there was no minimum size put on houses. That Part of that concern was affordable housing. Uh, lot sizes were cut down. I mean, it wasn't just for affordable housing, but it was certainly part of the conversation with, with the code that we had. Anyway, it, it, it's a lot of work. I would say maybe, uh, you know, just do residential B. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe not the whole village, just sneak it in on one of the... You know, I think one way around this, you know, in terms of handling, is like this whole street on Allen, where you've got 117, 117, 117, and our minimum frontage is 60 feet. You know, that's that's counterproductive as far as what we should have looked at on our minimum frontages. You know, I think our intent originally was to be able to take those large lots and be able to carve two of them out of almost every district. You know, so if our code said, if, if we had a tax amendment that said minimum frontages in residency was 45 feet, or 40 feet, you know, period, in, in all districts, or B and A and B, then we might get a little more buy-in and solve some of these problems, not all of them. But that would be a lot easier to manage, you know, from our end to make a recommendation for council than trying to create accessory lanes, uh, because that whole review to me is, is really there's a lot of layers that we have to get by and on in our report to council and those you know include services and access and setbacks and all of that stuff we have to detail each one of those and, and really get specific about why we think that's a good idea so um denise <laughs> is that, do you see any more of it Planning Commission can do tonight to address any of these. No, not tonight. Okay. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a discussion. It's just, yes, it is. I wasn't expecting to get a total answer to all this because it's complicated. But uh, but I wanted you to see just all the different kinds of examples that I'm getting, and um, how I interpreted the. Well, we can certainly add it to our agenda. I mean, not let the thing drop off, yeah. you know, but continue to put it on our agenda for discussion and maybe, you know, look at it a little deeper each each meeting to, to possibly get at least some solution Thinking quickly. The, and What you just talked about is decreasing the funding yeah. requirements and what the yeah. ramifications would be about that would be. And right. I'd certainly be interested in hearing more about that. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, I... <laughs> <coughs> I'm all for five lots. I mean, you know, so what? I mean, that's, that's my personal thing, but that has nothing to do with me sitting on this board representing, you know, the community. I mean, that's, that's a different interpretation yeah. of a code. So with, um, and then I'll wrap this up. So with um, ex Exhibit C and, or Exhibit B and <coughs> Exhibit D, I understood what you said about a variance on Exhibit D. Um, exhibit B, they pretty much could go ahead. Um, <clears throat> the interesting thing about that lot in the back is that lot is not 
the um, requirement for um, residential A, but we have something in the zoning code that says if there was a lot, even though it's not conforming to the code, if it exists before the code, and you can meet all the setbacks and lot coverage, you can still build on it. So, um, so he'd have to have, but what you're saying, the way I'm interpreting is this, he'd have to have 20 feet because it'd be 10 on each side. He'd have to have 20, a 20 foot wide easement mm -hmm. uh, of a lane that goes back at all points. It, have, it couldn't be any less than 20 feet yeah. for residential A. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. I don't interpret it as you can create an access easement to a lot off of a right of way. We're saying with a triangle going back, yes. and, and then the minimum correct. would be 20 feet. Yeah. Yes, correct. that's correct. Yeah, you could do one of those. Yeah. Well, he could actually, if that he had the room in the front, he could actually uh, not even make it an access easement. He could make right. it its own lot. Right. But yeah, that's what But let's say he doesn't want to make it an access easement, or he doesn't want to make it his own lot because he has stuff up here he still wants to have control over. He could, he could still go in, he could still go to the 60 feet and narrow, but he has to narrow no less than 20 feet because side yard setbacks are 10. And it has to be doubled, what you're saying. Is that what you're saying? I think it's the, the driveway width from the front down. Yeah, it would be 20 oh. feet because of the side um, setbacks. We don't have any driveway requirements. It would be the side it's setbacks, not a, it's 10 not and a 10. Driveway. Yeah. It's, it would be, there isn't yeah. an easement or an access term in that. It's a property line that meets the setbacks within that property line. But so she's saying if he, if he doesn't want to split it off into a separate lot, then, then the easement would have to be what? No, if he doesn't want to separate, off, separate it off as a separate lot, then he could have a land contract for an accessory dwelling unit on that property to be able to then show a bank for how that thing is separate in ownership and responsibility for finances. But this but is a separate lot on B. Just an access easement to the lot behind the red um, lot on B. No, I, I mean, I, I just don't, he's got to have 60 foot on Livermore, that shape, whatever, from 60 feet down to 20 feet. Okay, that's where, I'm, I get the 60 feet, the 20 feet, where'd you come up with the 20? For an 20 easement. 20 feet is two, it's two property lines that have the satisfaction of side yard setback. But if we're doing it, if see if they wanted an access easement, it would be the same requirements. I don't. It to me, it's a separate property. It, 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 it it's an access easement is a shared joint agreement between two property owners for access to to two properties. Yeah. You can't create a property. You can't create a lot without frontage. But it's, a, it's an existing lot. It's an existing. Yeah, in this case, he's going back to an existing lot. An existing landlocked lot. That, to me, is a non-conforming piece of green space. Well, but what about the Cory Street? But, but what well, well, we're but, talking about Livermore. Well, Livermore, I mean, yeah, but, I mean it, but, but that's what they do on Cory Street is just have 20 feet go back on an access easement to this other separate lot, A and B. They want to do the same thing they did with A to B. Yeah. Just the 20 feet out to Livermore. An See, I don't know. Easement. I mean, myself, I, myself, I would interpret how to create the lot. This is exhibit A. If, if you did, the minimum a, lot a, is, is 40 a. feet. Oh, okay. It's 40 feet yeah. in, in yeah, the yeah. district. Mm -hmm. So you take 108 and 74. That's 180. And divide that in three. And you've got three lots that you could 
divide off of Corey Street to get that configuration to work without an access easement or anything. But it's already been done. They have an access easement. Well, I'm, I'm, how that happened, yeah. I can't tell you. Okay. I, I'm just sure. trying to tell you how I well, interpret it. And all I'm saying since they did it already for Corey Street, it seems like they should be able to do it on Yeah. I think that's a real mistake. I, don't I mean, yeah. Right. I mean, and you, that's, that's a problem. Okay. I think that's a legal problem. Chris, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, well, again, I would just make the point that you that you raised, Rose, which is the there's a difference between replatting to create another lot and when there's already a land lot. But but this is in both cases, A and B, we have land locked, land locked existing lots, lot, yes. existing lots. So on and in A, an access easement was grant was developed, granted, whatever, approved. So. It seems to me that B, we should approve that for B. If but is B one lot the way it's the, the way I see that? That has to be. No, no it's we're just a lot, lot here. Oh, okay. Lot that's right. That's, yeah, yeah. that's where. Okay. Yeah, yes. All right. That was my fault. I keep forgetting. No, I didn't like one. I didn't like one. I should have. Yeah, we're talking about this tiny little lot at the back of the red yeah. lot. Yeah. Having, having access to Livermore Street, it's owned by the same owner. He wants to grant that other lot access without replatting. Now, I would say that in back in the day, folks bought lots and dedicated green space easements on those lots where a lot of these little islands are. They were intended to be common shared green space. Yeah. Okay, that was, and Yellow Springs is all about that. So, you know, during a period of time, creating these green space easements in backyards was the thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so there was access easements that literally allowed that to be shared amongst property owners that were contiguous to that piece of property. Now, so we have to make sure that there is a deed, there is not a deed restriction on that parcel being shared access to the neighbors that touch that parcel. Yeah. That first and foremost, before we could, no matter what we say, but we have to make sure that that is in fact not the case. And okay. then from there, see what happens. But it wouldn't surprise me if there's a green space. Well, those properties are co-owned, I believe. Those green not space necessarily. properties. They can be. They yeah, but there more, might be an easement on them. Yeah. So that they can't be built on. Because what, what happened is you had these estate lots and then you had smaller lots built up around the estate lots and the person who owned the estate yeah. dedicated that, that yeah, parcel the, of land the to the- lot the, um, just west of me, the, that uh, east, east of, of my property has shared lots in the middle. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Oh, that oh, one. Oh, yeah. That's not just case. So, but we don't know if it's, if it, there might be a deed restriction on it. Okay. So question, clearly not going to arrive at any kind of conclusive answer for Denise, but would the response you would be comfortable with be that this property owner would probably need to come before planning commission so that you could make a determination as to whether you would grant an exception, you would need to see a deed restrict. I mean, I think Denise is left with no answers whatsoever. Well, so mm -hmm. would it be to return before this body and have some of those questions answered? Because clearly they don't want to wait for a zoning code change several years down the road. How does uh, access easement, ha you can grant that, correct? We don't have to do that. Right. I think Denise is Denise thrashing can. about with that because you've had some pretty major difference just, of opinion about feel, um, usually and, and there happens. and and the the interpretation of that has been interpreted different ways okay i mean the way it's not it maybe um maybe just by fixing the statement of making it a little more clear um would help well there's some there you know the the downside of this is that there is precedent, and, and the precedent is every place but Yellow Springs, <laughs> because that's how it's interpreted. I mean, I fought this battle for 40 years, and 
have come up with unbelievably creative ways to make a goofy lot to, to build on things um, and take a lot of pride in that creativity. Um, but it's always with a fight. Yeah. You know, and but for the fact that I have that, those specific rules about what is, you know, the frontage, the setbacks, the rear yard, whatever they are, you just have to show compliance to those things in order to get approval, and they can't say no because then it becomes illegal. Yeah. Comes a um, takeaway. Denise, did you grant the access easement on Exhibit A? Is that what happened? Yes. Okay. So I'm not comfortable saying, oh, well, that was a mistake. <laughs> Sorry. So we're not going to do B. To me, it seems like if we did A, we granted that, we well, should grant B. I mean, I mean, I got legal a uh, legal opinion based okay. on what how we were interpreting guy? that co code, right, right. and um, and but as I tried to apply it to other things, it didn't quite. But this it there's this yeah, is and so I mean, th there's nothing from preventing us from stopping and not going any further until we clearly clarify what that. Means that, I think there's that a section of the code. I think there's a difference between existing mm -hmm. landlocked lots and I agree creating and new. creating a new one. And I think I mean I agree. I think what you I don't think but that if a you're was interpreting a it all the same based on mm -hmm. what like Ted is saying, then then that didn't have. I mean that had that had enough frontage on the on Corey. Mm -hmm that mirrored what was on the landlocked lot and mm -hmm. that's how i was understood it okay now if instead it has to have its own the front one in the front has to have 40 plus 40 for the back then that's a different interpretation than what i understood so far and and so mm -hmm. i think we just need to clarify that as we move forward because i don't want to just because we did one doesn't mean we can't just stop and say yeah, let's get so this does right. The easement, or does, we're just going to keep going. Does the easement extend and then go like that? Is what, sort of what you're talking about? Like that if you need 60 feet right here. Like right. if it were to go like this. So this has this has frontage. This has the 60 on it. However wide you wanted to make it, it goes back. Because it doesn't matter because it had the 60 on the front, as long as it said the 60 on the back, which it does. Yes. So how, how do you want to get it clarified? I think, Chris, maybe we could do some more legal. Look that up or do well, that, I mean, that's fine. I mean, I, mean, if, I don't you know. Want, if, I mean, if, if the commission wants a formal legal opinion, let's do that. I mean, I think that's the clearest way to okay. accomplish the clarity that I think everyone wants, and then yeah. to the extent that there there's some uncertainty with that, then it becomes a, a code interpretation, and uh, and I would also say that I think that, that most of you know that when interpreting zoning codes, it's it's a derogation to the rights of the property owner. So um, and given some of the interest in what the village wants to do vis-a-vis -vis infill affordable housing, I mean ultimately it, these policy decisions are made by the administrative bodies and the elected officers, not the lawyer. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it might just be something as simple as, you know, putting a period after have frontage on approved public street, period, and then go into, if you're going to do it on this, on these other things, then what is that supposed to look like? I mean, maybe just a little more of an explanation on those private streets or, or access easements maybe stronger clarification of how that's interpreted separated out a little bit but still be in that same section of the code okay yep. all right okay um, moving on because of the time i think i'm going to have to defer yeah i think we should defer the so, tiny so my discussion. thing is it's, it's shelved i can go for the bza though for a non-conforming lot Right? Nothing's been answered tonight. I'm not complaining. I'm just, I'm just yeah. clarifying. Yeah. Nothing's, Nothing's been answered tonight. Yes. Um, I'm not hearing that for BZA. I was saying, oh, I thought BZA was just for dimensional provisions of like, you know, small dimensional 
That's why I thought that one exhibit yeah. A. I mean, if you're asking for a variance <clears throat> through BZA, typically it's a foot or two off of what the standard says. BZA isn't going to waive the, well, how they interpret frontage. Okay. Could be completely different than the way that we interpret frontage. So if I do this as a formal proposal, do I come back to you guys or do I go to BZA? Um, to change the zoning code or to get your lot? I, I, would say, I think you start with the zoning administrator and go from there. But what is he coming to me for? I mean, I, there's nothing I can do right now with the way it is. It's 325 well, foot. Well, I mean, if he submits, if he submits a proposal to the village, mm -hmm. it's your job to deny that proposal. Mm -hmm. Then it's your job to look at what avenues he has to get variance on that denial, and that is in fact BZA. It's not planning. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Thanks, everybody. Okay, thanks. But we're going to continue to talk about flag yeah. lots. Yes. Uh, yes. Careful. <laughs> Be careful with these ones because people are going to want to do funnel shaped easements. Yeah. Yes. Well, they're going to play nice and just do a straight easement. Why can't they do a funnel shaped easement? Yeah. Easements are, are, easements are kind of nice guys. problematic. Um, um, correct. But the but, but my okay. understanding of BZA is that that's going to be that's so big yeah. that you know they might they might grant a little. Here oh, I don't think that there. he'll get approval. I mean, that's that's my own thing. I, right. But I mean, it, it would right be interesting to, for to for us working on what we're working on if we're going to work on this. If what BZA would to, say to yeah. that, I mean, it's yeah. his right to go. Yeah, absolutely, them. absolutely. Um, yeah. Okay. So, right. uh, do we want to? Um, I'll bring. I'm going to bring those back later. Okay. Oh, the other ones. Yes. Um, do we have a motion? Can I move to adjourn? You yeah. asked for a motion. Do we want to yeah. do agenda planning first, or did we do it? Not do agenda planning. So we're going to add we're going to add those items uh, back on again. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Essentially, we're recreating for agenda the all the old businesses. Yeah. yeah. That didn't get done. Yeah. Well, yeah. including minimum. Including minimum. Yeah. 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 Oh, right. And did uh, real quick though, did any did anybody have any update on the review as the comprehensive land use plan? That did you just do? done some work. I'm trying to get my school year. Okay, done. all right. So done, we'll, we'll, you, you can come back to us. Let us know when you want to have another meeting. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Um, so all yeah. all of those four things are going to be on old business again next meeting, which is next month. Is there any new business? Anybody has any new business? No one has any new business for next meeting. All right. Okay. Um, um, I have a question, a procedural question. Um, the Antioch proposal that they gave us. Was their intent to get some kind of preliminary reaction from us on where we may stand on that? I know I do that when I submit projects for clients if they're really questionable. No, actually the Housing Advisory Board just thought it might, might be a good idea if you guys just see it a little bit ahead of time. But they're so. going to be bringing this as a pocket neighborhood development. Okay. They're going to be the first ones to actually. I mean, was there anyone from Antioch code? here? No. Well, Tonight? Yeah. No, no, yeah. no. We just add Kevin McGruder sent that. To it was just a communication. Okay. It was just a communication. Yeah. That's but, cool. But it'll be the first pocket neighborhood development. Congratulations, oh, Ted, your little baby. Oh, well. No, we have not adjourned yet. Do I have a motion to adjourn? A baby. I move oh, well. we adjourn. Sorry. Yeah, Karen. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 I like that.